Hi, and Merry Christmas to everyone. Um, just bringing some people in now. Hello, Merry Christmas. I like to say that. I got so tired of the whole watered down happy holidays thing. Great to see you all. This is the first time I've done a uh, live, I guess, since uh, coming back from Egypt. And I've been waiting for my voice to get better because I literally lost my voice while I was in Egypt and it was crazy intense. Um, it came from some burst of radiation. Um, literally my throat was burned. And the night that I went into the Great Pyramid with uh, my good friend, Shervin, for his birthday, um, it was a wow experience across the board. But I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you guys what happened and what we did. We didn't, we had like a whole social media blackout on the whole trip. And um, there were lots of reasons behind that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into that, but... There were lots of reasons behind it. We wanted to keep, you know, kind of media stuff away from it. And also there were security concerns and risks, obviously with what's going on in Gaza. Uh, right now, uh, there was also substantial risk related to, to that and just traveling um, at this point in time with what's happening in the world. So we, we did keep it very quiet, but it was um, the most incredible trip I've ever been on, I have to say. And I've hosted many trips now. This one was very, very different. Um, it was completely uh, such a different circumstance and situation and all the people that were there made it so special as well. This was, um, you know, I, we had some of the people that, that you probably already know came on the trip with us were Matias DiStefano, uh, Billy Carson, uh, Shervin, uh, Danica Patrick, um, Violet and Marcus. I mean, there were lots of really, really interesting people. Blue of Earth, um, Andre Dukum, and I could go on and on and on with the list of people that were there. Uh, we came together because I had invited everybody to come. And I actually, you know, they had to cover their flights, but I covered all the expenses and so on the ground. And, and of course, it was a very, very special occasion. These are all people that in some way, shape or form had inspired me. Um, in my lifetime and had kind of taken my consciousness or awareness to an expanded place, I suppose. And so I wanted them to experience Egypt the way that, uh, that I knew that I could have them experience Egypt. And it was um, the most amazing trip I've ever been on. It was so harmonious. You know, <laughs> with so many people that host their own trips to Egypt, I didn't know how it was going to be. I wondered if people would be like wanting to take control and say, no, this is better. And this would be, you know, the best way to approach this and whatever. And none of that happened. It was completely without ego on the entire trip. And there were no leaders on the trip. I, well, I should say everyone was a leader, but there was no leader. Um, and that was very different. And it allowed us all to enjoy ourselves and to contribute in the ways that we knew we could best contribute. And everybody contributed in some way, shape or form. And, you know, we, I'll just go through the travel log aspect of it. So we arrived and we had an opening orientation. We had a very nice dinner that night um, at a place that was uh, a beautiful palace that had been uh, turned into a great dinner location for us. Um, it, was, uh, it was called El Maniel, which is a, a beautiful palace in, in Cairo. And then we all kind of went to bed that night. But before we had the dinner at El Maniel, we had an opening ceremony, which was to the four directions. This was led by Blue um, and Andre and Matias and Reggie, who absolutely crushed it. I, I couldn't believe what an amazing uh, ceremony they basically put together. And again, everything just happened so naturally. It was, uh, it was just beyond incredible. And then we went to the dinner. And then the next day, uh, we went to Saqqara. And while we were in Saqqara, you know, I wanted people to see the Serapium and I wanted to go underground. We went underneath the pyramid where there's an entire city uh, that has been discovered underneath Saqqara 
Djoser Pyramid, and it goes really deep. Many people have seen that there's a giant sarcophagus that is in this room that's in the middle of the pyramid that goes probably 70 feet high. Uh, the sarcophagus taking up probably about 25 feet of that, 20 to 25 feet. And then we went down into the deep network of tunnels, which no one even knows how deep this thing goes. Uh, I've been very deep into it, over 150 feet uh, of tunnel network into it underground, but um, we cannot see the end of it. There's an entire city underground, which is really astounding because it really makes you ask the question, why did they build this entire city underground? Then uh, we went from, uh, you know, we also went to the Serapium where there are 24 sarcophagi that are about close to a, 100 tons each, between 70 and 100 tons each. Nobody knows how they got them underground. And on every sarcophagus we have found a alpha omega, at least an alpha omega, if not most of them having alpha chi omega. Alpha chi omega has been etched into every one of the sarcophagi underneath the actual hieroglyphics that basically showed up on top of it. So these are very light etches, but they're clear for us to see. And, uh, and it's been amazing to find all of those, every one of them, uh, as having alpha chi omega. Alpha chi omega is actually the symbol on, supposed to be the symbol on the side of the Arcturian mothership, the Athena. Uh, I believe these sarcophagi are much older than what we are taught uh, that they are. And these are all, I believe, pre-dynastic. So we kind of took in all the energy there. And the first time I went to Serapium I, in 2017, I literally passed out because the energy was so powerful. I passed out, I remember waking up after about five minutes of being passed out, completely unconscious. Uh, and the Sim Hermain was pouring water on my face trying to revive me. And um, because the energy in that place was so powerful. And there's a place that if you go inside, you'll feel the energy come through you. And you can stand up and put your arms like this. And you'll have this energy passing straight through you. And you're like an antenna for this energy. Uh, and this is called the Ka the ka position. So both my arms are out like this, right? The ka position. The ka position takes you to this spirit realm. It has this uh, powerful aspect to it. You just feel this electromagnetic industry, in, in, energy just passing straight through you. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was such an amazing experience to be there. But I did forget to mention that the night before everyone else arrived, I went with uh, Shervin to the Great Pyramid and I wanted to give him as a birthday present because it, uh, it was his birthday the day before. I wanted to give him as his birthday present, uh, you know, a very private experience in the Great Pyramid. It was just going to be the two of us. And we become really good friends over the past several years. And, and I wanted him to experience this. And he couldn't make prior trips. So I really wanted him to see what this was going to be like. And boy, did we ever have an amazing experience. We, we went in. Uh, we went of course, first into the Queen's Chamber, which, you know, when you go into Al Mamun's entrance, uh, and it's very much believed by most Egyptologists that, that this caliph in the ninth century must have had a map because how could he have known to burrow into the pyramid and basically take this gigantic piece of the structure out and then have it land exactly where he needed to land to get to the Grand Gallery, which then leads you to the the, the great uh, uh, king's chamber and, and then also has the passage directly into the queen's chamber. So we went in the queen's chamber and I showed uh, Shervin and the Egyptologist that was there uh, that was sort of the guardian of the pyramid that night all of the things on the walls. Um, one of which is a, uh, a very interesting sort of petroglyph etch on the wall of Osiris. And Osiris is pointed towards the north. So this is on the, <clears throat> on the east wall, right? And he's facing north out towards the entrance of the Great Pyramid. And you can even see his vertebrae. It's done in a way that almost looks like he's been x-rayed. Uh, I posted pictures of this on here before, and I had the opportunity to present all of this to, um, to one of the leaders of the Ministry of Antiquities, uh, on my last day there, they actually closed the Great Pyramid during the daytime, uh, which they never do, in order for me to present it to um, 
basically the the upper brass of the uh, the Ministry of Antiquities, which was which was really interesting and, and a great opportunity. Uh, they were stunned and startled and at how they could actually see all the images as well. Uh, so after I showed him the Osiris, then there was a younger version of Osiris on the other wall. So if you're looking in the Queen's Chamber, there's a uh, you can see this gable. Uh, ent- you know, not an entrance, but rather it's a um, it's kind of a hole that looks like it's made to be a cacophony of sound. So it's got these gables that takes it all the way up, and and there are five of these uh, of these uh, corbels that basically go towards the ceiling. In the grand gallery, there are seven, and you'll find that you'll that's something you see a lot of these seven corbels that basically go up, and the grand gallery looks like. You know, it's almost like you're inside a musical instrument, but it doesn't look like it's an ancient musical instrument. It looks like it's a modern musical instrument. It looks like it's like way modern compared to where we are in time today, which is uh, super fascinating. And that struck me the first time I went there because it started making me think, when were the pyramids actually built? And how could they have been built with such a modern architecture? Because the architecture truly is modern when you go inside. Um, and then I uh, showed Shervin also all of the other things on the walls. Uh, there's a, a woolly mammoth uh, on one of the walls and its child. Uh, there's a large crocodile and another crocodile on that wall as well. Uh, and then there are two people walking. One of them is holding what looks like a baby uh, towards the east. And there's an ibis bird, which represents, of course, Thoth, as well in the upper corner. So um, all of these Things can be seen on the walls in the pyramid. But for some reason, people passed over them. And it's like Dolores Cannon basically predicted. She said that there were hidden things in the walls of the pyramid that nobody would notice until the right people with the right symbols, the symbols had to match, uh, would come in and be able to see them and use them in our day. And she said that 10 years ago. I even know she said that until this past summer when someone forwarded it to me. So from there, we went to the the king's chamber and uh, Shervin and I were doing that. And I showed Shervin, I just made this really cool game. Our team uh, at uh, Orion made this new game called Maya. And Maya, we were able to stitch together the entire king's chamber in its original look and to make it as if you're in an AR virtual reality game of it. So if I use Maya here in this, uh, in this house, for example, I could literally walk through the king's chamber uh, with, you know, and be able to see all the things on the walls. And then there's also an aspect of Maya where it allows you to hit the hint button so you could actually see the outline tracing of some of these things. But the game is about raising consciousness. So you have to be able to find it and see it on your own because pattern recognition is a core aspect of raising your consciousness to the next level of higher states of awareness. Being able to see patterns, and it's funny because the world likes to say, oh, that's pareidolia, right? Uh, Seeing patterns is like crazy or whatever. (laughs) And now I look at all this stuff and I kind of laugh because I say to myself, well, not being able to see patterns is also just a, a different stage of our awareness and consciousness that we choose. But being able to see patterns is a critical aspect, especially being able to see the patterns of your life. And the things that you keep repeating over and over again are the things that are causing you generally the most challenges. And if you don't have anything in your life that's repeating over and over again, it's probably because you haven't recognized it yet. But in this world, we, I believe, are here and we exist so that we can experience and learn. And as we experience and learn and we go through life, The things we don't learn, we have to experience again and again. And we will continue to experience it until we finally learn it. (laughs) It's kind of funny because a lot of people think Earth is an escape room. How do we get out of this matrix simulation game? And the only way to get out of this game is to transcend it. It's to fall in love with it. And choosing love over judgment is what Christ consciousness is all about. You know, I have been saying to people today, I'm like, marry Christ consciousness. Um... Because I think that Jesus Christ was an exemplar of choosing love over fear, choosing love over judgment. And I think judgment is the cause of all suffering. Um, And I'll I'll say that because the things that we judge are the things that we attract over and over and over again. And if there's anything the Great Pyramid has taught me, 
is that there's so much more to be seen that we're just simply not seeing. It's not that it's not there. And it's a metaphor for this universe because there's so much more to the universe. I don't believe that anything in this universe is random. I make a random number generator. I can tell you right now, I don't believe in randomness. I believe in something existing that we would say is in the realm of we don't know what we don't know. So it's a delineation between the conscious, the unconscious, and the subconscious mind. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately because I've been sort of using unconscious and subconscious synonymously. Um, I don't think that they're actually synonymous. I, it's been really getting under my skin to think about this. I had a podcast with Teal Swan. We talked about it. She also uses it synonymously, but I don't think I'm going to use it synonymously anymore because I, I believe that what we call to and what we refer to in the world of what we know is what we believe is our conscious mind. The things that we know we don't know, I would say, are our subconscious mind. But then the things that we don't know that we don't know, that would be what I would call the unconscious mind. The three actually work together. And eventually, as we learn to merge our subconscious and unconscious minds into our conscious experience, that's when we actually start to achieve a higher state of awareness and enlightenment. That's when consciousness expands. And once consciousness expands, it doesn't go back to what it was. So, you know, beware for those of you that are going through this awakening process. Once your consciousness expands, you know, you can't go back as it'd be like Cypher in the Matrix and, you know, go back and have all your memories erased unless you probably go back and get reincarnated again. And that's what the reincarnation process actually is. So when you think about merging all those different realms of existence, it means that all of it, literally all of it's patterned. It's just we're not aware of all the patterns. Some patterns we are aware of. The other patterns we're not aware of. And so the same thing with the Great Pyramid. The walls seemed absolutely barren with nothing there. But actually, now you can't unsee it once you see it. And they're full. And I have a big announcement to make because just before this trip, we had discovered that the images on the walls of the Great Pyramid were not just images. You know, I'll tell you that on one wall, if you saw my show Codex, you'll know that on the north wall, there's a bull and there's a diamond over the heart of the bull. It's got a very large diamond shape over its heart. You'll also know there's an inverted diamond as well. It matches my logo. Strangely, I didn't even know this because I chose the logo many years before. But what's fascinating about this, there's a larger cow around that bull. So again, each time you see something, you could actually start to see more and more. This is the same with awareness. As we become aware of things, we start to become more aware of the things that we were no longer or we were not aware of previously. There's also a bird that looks like a phoenix and a Bennu bird right next to it, a, a white, large Bennu bird above it as well. There are dragons on the wall that form the shape of DNA that intertwine with each other. There's a tree. Then if you look at the east wall of the king's chamber, so this would be the wall opposite of the sarcophagus, there's a woman riding what looked like either a stag or it could be a woman riding atop a horse of some sort. And we later learned that it was Pegasus, but she's riding a horse with wings and shooting a bow, an arrow, with an arrow towards a large eagle up on the wall as well. So when I started to present this game to a fellow by the name of uh, James Robert Comber, who is a uh, astrologist as well as an astronomy expert and just wrote a book on the Dacon uh, that is going to be coming out in a few months. Basically, he looked at it, he said, wait a minute. So you've got a bull and a cow on the north wall and you've got a, um, you know, a woman riding looks like a horse or a stag, shooting an arrow at an eagle? I said, yeah, on the east wall. He said, so what's on the south wall? I said, looks like a water scene. There's something with serpents and uh, coming across, but I, I can't totally make it out. And basically what, uh, what he said to me then immediately was, geez, wait this of astrology. And I said, whoops. Uh-oh. Hang on a 
a second. There we go. Okay. He says, you're describing the day count of astrology. And I was like, wait, what? How could this be the day count of astrology? And he said, well, first of all, what about on the west wall? I said, on the west wall, it looks to be a king's head or a king's face. And, and, and I said, and, and there's like a, an alien head also on that side. Uh, and there's a lot of other stuff on that wall that we can't totally make out. There's definitely an eye of Ra on that wall because that also matched with the Last Supper. Oh, you can't hear me now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. So he basically says this to me. And, uh, and so I go to uh, him and I said, so how, why do you think it's the Dacon on the walls of the pyramid in the king's chamber? And he said, well, easy. Uh, the Dacon break up the year into 10 day segments. And so each astrological sign, the four cardinal signs, you know, or the fixed signs rather, being Taurus, Leo, Aquarius and Scorpio, right? They would be at the four different walls of this structure. And I said, yeah, and he said, and within each of those, there are three different astrological symbols and constellations that fit within those. So for example, within Taurus, the three that are within Taurus would be uh, Ostriga, Eridanus, and Orion. And so I said, okay, so Ostriga, Eridanus, and Orion. And then we started looking at all of the other ones. And so we looked at Aquarius and, and in Aquarius, we start noticing that the ones that should be on that wall should be a Pegasus, a woman, which is the Delphinus, right? Which is holding an arrow, the Sagitta, shooting it at the eagle, Aquila. And those are exactly in order of the Dacon. So we're like, wait a minute. So this means that the walls are covered in the Dacon? And they are, they're covered in the Dacon. So there's an entire astrological map or clock on all the walls. That means Ophiuchus is on the south wall. That means that, uh, that there would be the adjacencies to uh, Scorpio and within Scorpio, uh, the serpents, as well as the corona borealis, the crown, would be on the south wall. So now we knew what to look for. And of course, we have this app now that has the entire recreation, perfect recreation of the king's chamber right within it. So I started thinking, well, wait a minute, I can now look at this everywhere. So on the flight over towards Egypt, I literally was mapping out all of the astrological symbols on the walls and finding exactly where they are because now we know the thing that we couldn't recognize. Uh, Chervin discovered one on the west wall, which was Cassiopeia. He found exactly the position that Cassiopeia should be in. Now, there's one caveat here, because what we found was that actually, the only difference of this is that it was running backwards. So this astrological clock was not going in a clockwise way, it's going in a counterclockwise way. It's telling us something different about time. Now, if we think about time and we think about astrology, you know, you start off with, you've got Aquarius. Aquarius then becomes, as we go from, you know, late January and, and mid-February, um, it then turns to Pisces, right? And then Pisces becomes, um, you know, Pisces becomes Aries and Aries becomes Taurus and then Taurus becomes Gemini. Then Gemini becomes Cancer and Cancer becomes Leo. Right, And it goes in that order. But when it comes to the great procession of the great year, it's backwards. It doesn't go forwards. It goes backwards. Now, this is really important to notice because what I believe this is telling us, the reason why the walls are backwards, it goes from north and then the, the east wall of the Great Pyramid is you know, not going to Gemini from Taurus. It's not going from Taurus to Gemini, Gemini to Cancer and then Cancer to Leo. That goes the other direction. It's going actually from Taurus to Aries. And then from Aries and the Dacon within each of those are then etched into the walls. And then on the, on the uh, east wall, you have Aquarius, 
right? So it's basically going Taurus, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius. Now in the great procession of equinox, a lot has been spoken of the fact that we're into going into this new era, this new aeon that is called Aquarius. Well, we, we came out of Pisces. Again, this is illustrating exactly what I mean. That's a backwards procession. And procession, the word procession means to go backwards, to process. Not process, but precess. So our clock goes forward in time through the zodiac. It goes forward in time, just as you go from Aquarius to, to uh, Pisces, the Pisces to Aries, Aries to Taurus, then Taurus to Gemini, Cancer, and, and, uh, and, and Leo. But when it goes to the great clock, it goes backwards. So wait a minute. Does this mean somehow that time is acting like a Klein bottle or a Mobius strip where it's both going forwards in the proximal cycle that you're in for this year, but in the long cycle, it actually reverts back on itself? That's a deep, deep thought and a really interesting question to ask, right? Because time is a Taurus. And probably if I would describe it as anything from my understanding of, of physics and science and mathematics would be that it's a Klein Taurus, that it reverts back on itself. It's like a snake that eats its own tail on the great year. So that means that what we think of as the time is going forwards only, it's actually also simultaneously going backwards. That's deep. And I believe that the builders and the people that place these etchings on the walls um, were actually very knowledgeable of the great year, the 24,000 year cycle. And a lot of people say, oh, it's 25,920, Robert. No, I don't believe it's 25,920. I believe it's 24,000. And I believe there's good foundational basis for that. Because as we get closer on the you know, Satya Yuga side, right? In the Kali Yuga, we've been in the, in the Dark Ages. We've been in the Iron Age. As we get into the Golden Age period, what happens is our time sort of speeds up. It speeds up quite a lot because our gravitational pull becomes stronger. We have something called mass time dilation. So when you look at it from the perspective of a, a pendulum that's swinging, you could look at it as a five base, 12 and 13 triangle shape, which could also be a 10 base, a, uh, uh, a 24 and a 26. So the 24 would be the height of this triangle with a base of 10 and a hypotenuse of 26. So you've got effectively a 24,000 year cycle and it swings out as we go farther away from our sister stars. And as we're farther away from it, our gravity uh, reduces, the mass time dilation actually gets such that time actually slows down. So the slow side of the cycle is 13,000 years. It's 12,960 years. But the short side of the cycle is much, much shorter than that. You know, it's, uh, you would take the exact same proportion of the 10, 12, or sorry, the 10, 24, 26 triangle, uh, which is also the 5, 12, 13, the perfect triangle, the only triangle that has the same uh, area as its perimeter. Then you would take that and swing it and make another right angle on the base of it, right? So you're creating a logarithmic relationship with these right triangles. And the other length, is now no longer 24, but it's approximately 22. So that means you've got approximately 11,000 year cycle on the short side of the cycle, and you've got a 13,000 year cycle on the long side of the cycle, and the center of it, the mean value is 24,000. And this is consistent with the holy science in Sri Yukteswar's uh, writings as well. I just put the mathematics to it. So if the builders of the pyramid had the knowledge of the 24,000 year cycle, and we now have evidence that the walls are covered, literally covered in overlapping, not just any kind of art, but perspective, perspective astrological signs. So drawing in perspective is something that is only accompanied when higher consciousness is available in the world. We saw this in the Renaissance. Perspective drawings means that you have this ability to take a two dimensional object and to put a third dimensional perspective into it so that you can create an illusion. 
anyone that I know that gets, spends a lot of time on perspective artwork starts to realize how easily you could basically create a simulation. Because a two-dimensional object can be turned into what looks like it's truly alive. And then with motion associated with that, you've got a simulation, an illusion, a maya. So effectively, <clears throat> when we realized that they were all the Dacon, the 36 Dacon, and the 12 astrological, primary astrological symbols, then we started looking because we knew what to look for on the walls. And we've now found over half of the 48 uh, astrological symbols that have been etched in the walls. And thankfully, while there's been a recent uh, scrubbing of the walls as well, which makes it more difficult because they leave acid on the walls, I was able to convince the ministry to stop the restoration effort with these harsh chemicals that were hurting the walls uh, because all of this is etched into the wall. Now, how is it etched into the wall? I can only tell you what I've seen. Now, you may know that there's been a lot of work done by people like Veda Austin and a few others, uh, uh, Emoto, Professor Emoto, before he passed away, that if you think a thought next to a glass of water and then freeze flash that thought, or that glass rather, you're gonna find whatever you're thinking, there's a high correlation between the shape of the fleet freeze flashing, or flash freezing, excuse me, um, and what you're actually, what you've actually been thinking. So there's something about this transmission of our consciousness into water that's adjacent to us. Now you may have heard of this before, because water has memory. Water can carry uh, information and memory, just like plasma and ether can, right? But so if you take that one step further, they've actually found that the same phenomenon exists and it's been tested. It exists when you do the same type of thing with liquid crystal. So liquid crystal, you could think a thought and leave that shape into the crystal of the liquid crystal structure, just like you can with water and then freeze flash it. And there's a uh, flash freeze, I keep saying that wrong. There's been quite a lot of research on this and recent research has come out on liquid crystal for this as well. Now, just fast forward in time a bit and start to think, well, does that mean that we're gonna start using water and liquid crystal for memory and storage? Probably, we already do. That's what DNA is. DNA is basically a structure within water because it's 90% plus water that houses terabytes and terabytes of data. It's the most efficient storage that we have on earth today is the DNA structure. So if you were going to find a way to store information, you could do it in water, you could do it in liquid crystal. You want to do it in something that's not easy to move. What about granite? What about specifically rose granite? Which by the way is 55% quartz crystal. You could leave memories, you could leave imprints into this solid crystal structure. It's not a leap to say going from liquid crystal, being able to put that thought imprint into liquid crystal could also go into the granite structure itself because of its crystalline structure. Granite again, 55% quartz crystal. And of course it has a resonance characteristic as well. So what I've seen uh, in my meditations and thoughts about this are literally monks and spiritualists who are able to think thoughts and put all of this imagery into the granite walls. Now, it's got a light edge, so you might say, well, wait, you know, I saw the built bull, Robert, but how is that, if you looked at it from the side, what's it look like? There's a very different etching that's on the wall, the parts and the design aspect of it than the rest of the wall. But I will say that the way they did the artwork on this, and I'll eventually post it, um, but I'm gonna write a book with the, with the top Egyptologist, uh, probably the, one of the most famous Egyptologists in the world, on this exact discovery. So I'm gonna probably try to get pieces of it out to you earlier, but um, I'll, I'll tell you right now that this is gonna be obviously big news because what I believe this is telling us is that the builders had a knowledge of the processional clock. Whether you believe or not that they could put those thoughts into the walls, like you know Buddhist style monks who could actually meditate and put them into the walls, or that they found other, some other way 
to etch it in this very precise way, it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that they're there. And we've now got an ability, ability to find every one of those Dacon astrologies. Now, what's also interesting is the Dacon is also what is listed on the Dendera uh, you know, petroglyph in relief that came uh, out of the ceiling or the wall. Um, there was a ceiling structure that came out. There's also one that's in the upper wall right when you get into Dendera. But uh, the one that was in the ceiling, the, the Dendera Zodiac as it's called, today sits in the Louvre Museum in, in Paris, France. But they had the Dacon in there. So the Dacon is the astrological uh, significance. So for example, right, within the month of uh, May, right, and late April, you would say, if you're not using, if you're using the, the, the Western, right, or the tropical system uh, versus the, the, you know, sidereal, Basically, what you would find is that each of these are broken into the different three aspects. So Orion sits inside of Taurus. It's the last part of Taurus uh, constellation of the three. I said it was Ostriga uh, and, and uh, Eridanus that are the other two within Taurus. And what this basically shows us is that the Egyptians were using the Dacon and they must have got it from somewhere. Uh, and there's no beginning to when astrology was first recorded. If you try to look for it in history, it shows up in the Epic of Gilgamesh, our oldest books. It shows up in the Bible. The 12 tribes of Israel were related to the zodiacal signs. Um, you know, Judah was the lion, it was Leo. And as we look at, you know, Manasseh, Manasseh and Ephraim was, uh, was the bull. Uh, it was Taurus. So you had these fixed signs within the Zodiac that were related directly back to the 12 tribes of Israel as well. So this is a new discovery. And when Shervin and I were in the pyramid together, we were literally, I was showing him with a laser pointer, all the ones that I already discovered. And then we were trying to find other ones and we found many. Uh, like I said, we found Cassiopeia. Uh, we found Serpens, we found Corota Borealis, we found Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus, and while I was sitting there in the king's chamber and, and Shervin was laying in the sarcophagus for his first experience, I was looking at the north wall because I was trying to find, I knew that the symbol of the two diamonds that were you know, basically uh, put into each other, like the logo that I have, I knew that that already existed and that was also a symbology of Orion. If you look at the shape of the Orion constellation, it looks like two triangles Basically, it looks like it's been stretched or skewed, right? And um, so when I, I was looking at this wall, I was looking at the bull and I was thinking, you know, there must be something on there that would point us to possibly the face of Orion. And because on the west wall behind the sarcophagus, there is a giant face of a king with a crown and everything and his name is Cestius. Cestius is one of the constellations. He was the king of Ethiopia. He was, was, a, was a Cushite king who was married to Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia was right next to him. And they had a daughter named Andromeda who was supposed to be fed to the Kraken, right? And, and if you've read Greek mythology, you'll know that these stories have been around for a long time. So I thought, well, there must be, if there's an Ophiuchus that shows his whole body, there must be a face of Orion. And then all of a sudden, it just popped out to me that fast. And I saw the entire face of Orion etched into the wall. And I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. Then uh, Shervin got out of the sarcophagus at, right after I saw that, and I decided to lay inside of it. And I've been in there so many times. I've spent 17 nights inside the Great Pyramid now. I visited it more than 35 times. And I can tell you that I laid down in the sarcophagus for the first time something happened, I started doing an ohm chant to resonate the chamber and I started coughing and I could not stop coughing. It was uncontrollable coughing. And Shervin comes over with some water. He's like, hey man, are you getting hypoxia in there? I'm like, no, it's got an open, open uh, you know, top. There's not, I'm not like a, I'm not, you know, breathing out of a paper bag or something. But I just couldn't stop coughing. I couldn't figure it out. And I felt like my throat had just been burned, literally burned. And I lost my entire voice for the week, which was crazy because here I was hosting this trip 
uh, that was uh, called Exodus to Egypt. Exodus, you'll leave the old world behind and enter a new one. And uh, the theme of the whole trip was free your voice. So here I was, I had no voice. The entire week I was in Egypt with this whole crew of you know, big creators and influencers. And I knew I had to give a lot of presentations and everything. And um, I was like dreading the fact that literally I couldn't speak. It was super painful uh, for over a week and a half. And I'm just now getting over it. And I've been back already for you know, over a week. So I had that experience. I came out of the sarcophagus and I didn't you know, think that much of it except that I had just seen this face of Orion. I had just seen all of these different etchings on the wall. And if you'd like, uh, if you join my Telegram chat, I will post uh, these photographs of this in my Telegram chat so that you can you could all see it yourselves. Um, I'm not probably gonna do it so openly uh, because I have a very good relationship with the Egyptian government. I am very lucky that way. And, um, and I, I don't want to you know, upset them in any way, shape or form. Uh, because this is going to be pretty explosive, I think, for people when they realize that this has been there all along. So um, so go to my Telegram chat. You could get into my Telegram chat just through my profile page on Instagram. Uh, and, and you could basically join into it. Um, and, and my Telegram chat is, uh, you know... It kind of drives me nuts sometimes because it's full of bots, unfortunately. That's the only way, if you have an open page where people could come into it uh, without me having to spend the time to like allow people in and make sure they're not bots, um, it's kind of a pain. But I'm gonna be moving to Orion here very shortly. It's already up and running. And we used Orion as our only communication method for our trip uh, when we were in Egypt for everyone that was there. We've got about 10,000 people in the waiting room right now to go in to the, um, into the beta. Uh, and we're letting people in, you know, on the basis, the timeline that we wanted to, to make sure we do all of our testing and everything works perfectly. And I'll, I was happy to say, despite terrible cell coverage in Egypt, it worked great. So we, we, we kind of ran without a hitch, which was really, really fantastic. I was happy about that. Um, so basically, Servine and I were in there. And then from there, we decided to go down into the subterranean chamber. And we went in the subterranean and there's a large well there that goes down about 20 some odd feet. And it's about 300 feet in a passageway down. So you go from the, the Great Pyramid, and by the way, if you've never been to the Great Pyramid, you'll be sore the next few days. Uh, it exercises muscles you didn't think you had. And that's a real challenge because everybody is sort of hunched over and their thighs, their quads are really worked. But we went down and there's a part where you have to crawl through this kind of dusty shaft. And we ended up getting into uh, the main area of the subterranean chamber. And there, Chervine discovered something I'd never seen before, which was a, a person laying down. You could see that they'd been carved. It had been carved that way. Now, people believe that the subterranean chamber uh, obviously was, was a very sacred place, even prior to the pyramids building. That this was a place that uh, ancient peoples would go to worship and it was a, a, a sacred spot, you know, the throat chakra of the earth. So we went into this little passage. There's a passage that's about two feet by two feet wide. So two feet high, two feet wide. And you can crawl in it for 56 feet and it ends in a wall. And it's pretty sharp because the whole thing is, is turned to quartz crystal. It's limestone tunnel that's turned to quartz crystal. Nobody knows why the tunnel ends in a wall. There's a face at the end of the wall. Uh, I'll post that also in my, uh, in my telegram chat. But you go in there and it's a place that you're supposed to go to kind of conquer your fear because it does definitely take a little bit of courage to go in there because it's dark in there, super dark. And any fears that you have, Drum Velo Melchizedek and others have said, will manifest in there. So people claim that there have been people that have died inside that tunnel. Um, I've been in it. And the first time I went in, it was very scary. And then after that, it wasn't very scary. But uh, Shervin and I went into that together. And we, while we were in there, we said a, uh, a prayer. And it was a, a very solemn moment because you could feel like you're literally inside this structure that is millions and millions of tons on top of you. And 
and the whole thing still resonates. So if I'm talking inside that tunnel, you'll hear my voice resonate the chamber, just like my voice will resonate the chamber when I'm laying in the sarcophagus, it's also true. So we did that, uh, that was a very special experience for Shervin and then his, we came out of the pyramid after we'd been in there for several hours and, uh, and then we went back to our hotel at Mina House. Now, I didn't realize it, but a, a few nights later, at about 2.22 in the morning, I wake up and I get this transmission. I wasn't the only one. Uh, Zach Bush woke up around the same time, uh, had a similar type transmission, as he called it as well, uh, about biodiversity. I had this transmission that also included information about biodiversity. And it also included information about the pyramid itself and what its true nature is. That the astrological symbols that are carved into the walls are actually a coordinate system. That each block in the king's chamber is a different size. It has a different X, Y axis and a different Z axis value. And nobody has known why they chose different block sizes for every one of the blocks in the walls. And this transmission that came in basically said that this was a coordinate system for each of those constellations. That as many have believed for a long time, that maybe the Great Pyramid is actually some kind of stargate. Now, I don't have any evidence of this other than what we've discovered. So I don't wanna basically go out on a limb right now and say definitively it is, or the only other evidence I had is that I had this download in the middle of the night and I was one of probably 10 people that had similar downloads that night at the exact same time. And it was, uh, it was pretty freaky because what this download said, and, and I had this full on transmission, was that the, the Great Pyramid is actually a spiritual ascension stargate that only those of higher awareness and consciousness are able to access its uses. And it's been built that way for a reason. Now, I'll say this. I have been out the ceiling of the King's Chamber before. I've seen it turn into a flower of life, but that was in an astral travel capacity. Uh, that happened the first time to me in 2018, and I experienced it. And as sure as I'm sitting here talking to you right now, it happened. But on my last trip to Egypt last March, we had many of us inside the king's chamber, and the moment we all perceived and saw the face of Cestius, this king, on the west wall behind the sarcophagus, um, several of us noticed that the ceiling basically turned into sky, like it wasn't there. Now, it kind of freaked me out for a moment because I was like thinking, wait a minute, what happens if we all like go out, you know, in this astral travel like I did before out of the small hole, but now the entire ceiling of the King's Chamber looked like that. Um, it was pretty freaky, I have to say. <laughs> so I was worried about it because I'm like, I gotta get these people home also. And the transmission I got was that the king's chamber can be used as a stargate and that it requires a higher level of dimensional awareness and that higher dimensional awareness can only come when we learn how to balance the masculine and feminine aspects of ourselves. It can only come when we learn how to merge the subconscious, the conscious and the, and the unconscious mind into a super conscious mind and that each of the petroglyphs that are on the wall have within them, they're like a QR code for our consciousness. They're a QR code to awaken our subconscious into the conscious mind. And those QR codes come with a compression of data. And that what I got in this transmission was that the reason why I started coughing like mad is that the compression got triggered and released after seeing the face of Orion on the wall and then laying in the sarcophagus, the information was like a fire wire that went straight into my cerebral cortex and into my cerebellum in particular, through the throat. It goes straight through the throat chakra. Uh, that's where the information comes through. So my throat was burned, it still is burned, very painfully so. And strangely, I'll say this, that Billy Carson had bought a Geiger meter and uh, he sent it to me in California before I left to go to Egypt. 
And he said, I want to measure the radiation inside of the, uh, the king's chamber. I want to measure this. And so he bought a Geiger meter and he was flying directly from Bora Bora to Egypt. And so I got the Geiger meter at my office and I brought it with me. And unfortunately, Billy had to leave Egypt earlier um, than was planned because he and Elizabeth both were not feeling well. They both had some sickness that had been carrying over uh, from when they were in Bora Bora. And so he didn't take the Geiger meter with him. So I kept the Geiger meter and I decided to use it to measure the level of radiation in my throat. And it was four times the normal level of radiation on the rest of my body, which was totally crazy. The other aspect of the download that I got that night was to be careful of the radiation. The radiation um, can be really, really problematic. And several people got that same transmission. So part of the other message that I received was that, that the biodiversity of the planet and that the Hall of Records, the Hall of Records, the Halls of Amenti could actually be accessed and you don't have to access it by digging under the Sphinx, that you can access it from inside the King's Chamber and access the Hall of Amenti and the, the Hall of Records from inside the King's Chamber. Now, that was like news to me. And so this was part of the transmission that I got, but that certain things had to be done and performed before that could happen. But that this was gonna be an important thing to do uh, because to restore the biodiversity to Earth. That, that was a, a big aspect of this, that the biodiversity of Earth had to be returned um, in about 2030. So this was a very, very interesting transmission. I thought I was the only one that got it. I went to breakfast and everyone was talking about the transmissions they got the night before not being able to sleep. And they were different aspects of the same transmission for everyone. So I tell you this uh, because I don't know what's going on. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna say to you that I understand all of this because I definitely don't. All I can tell you is that it happened and the, the petroglyphs are on the walls. There is an astrological clock on the walls of the King's Chamber. Um, you will be seeing more and more of this uh, as time goes by. And, and it's all embedded within the Maya app. So tonight I can go explore the King's Chamber from inside this room right now, uh, which is uh, a fabulous uh, benefit to have because we reconstructed the entire thing to perfection. And that was not an easy job to undertake. So then the whole crew came and we had a, um, uh, we had a dinner and an event that was like a white party at the Sphinx. Some of you may have seen uh, some of the posting that was done by uh, Billy Carson on this. And then from there, we, we went to all three pyramids. So, and of course, because of the significance of Orion, I was hoping, you know, maybe I could get a gobo light to shine Orion uh, which is our new messaging app that basically is completely mega, mega encrypted with the world's strongest encryption. Um, and it can work with any size group. So unlike every other you know, messaging app that has like encryption, that is an antiquated encryption, not only is this new encryption, but also it could be used with hundreds of millions of people on a single chat and still all be very, very strongly encrypted. And so there's no censorship on this platform. No monitoring. The monitoring, it's more like a white label platform that people can create their own communities on and then they have responsibility for monitoring that. So I wanted to have like a gobo to have a rhyme. Of course, you can't put that on the, on the pyramid. And we were right in front of the Sphinx. But I didn't need to do that because when we went to the Great Pyramid, Orion Constellation was right over the Great Pyramid. Uh, four hours later, when we came out, it was standing right on top, like literally standing on top of the Great Pyramid. And then each pyramid we went to for the next uh, two hour segments, after that we were in the Great Pyramid for four hours, two hours in Caffrey, which has been closed for the last several months, and then two hours in uh, Minkari Pyramid. And um, it was amazing because we went inside the, uh, the Great Pyramid and you, know, you climb up, you get in the King's Chamber and who's in there but Alan Green. Alan Green, who's been my friend and partner for the past five years 
on all of our work we did decrypting uh, da Vinci's work on Vitruvian Man and several other paintings now uh, that we've done together. Um, he was in there because I had asked him to give a presentation, a special presentation. I didn't know how special it was going to be. I didn't ask him to do it inside the Great Pyramid. I asked him to do it. I thought he was just going to do it at the Mina House and, and give us a presentation there. First of all, the King's Chamber, nobody presents in this place. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you're looking at a room that's about 35 feet by 17 and a half feet. And you can't fit more than 50 people in there. And 50 people is tight. And plus it's hot, even in winter. It's hot in that room all the time. It's always hot. And you know, plus you've been climbing up to get in there. Well, we walk in and the first person I see is Alan Green wearing a white tuxedo with a white top hat and white shoes. And, and I'm like, okay, wow. And I was kind of sweating bullets because I've seen Alan, you know, he's a jokester and I've seen him crash and burn big time before on performances that were out of place. The first time I invited him to a board meeting for my company, uh, it was the day after Halloween and he decided to dress as a heretical Pope. And he decided to perform an exorcism on me that he titled one over exorcism. Uh, and it was super nerdy and not really that funny. Uh, and it was painful to watch, to be honest. And he thought he was sacked after he did it. Uh, and my, my German board members that are very serious had not even cracked a smile on their faces. It was painful. So I thought this could go that direction with Alan. Sometimes you never know. I love Alan to death, but sometimes you never know. And I had to just sort of like sit there and it was so hot. And I'm like, okay, Alan, Alan was fidgeting, trying to get ready and everything for it. And then he started by giving a dialogue of God. He actually played the part of God inside the Great Pyramid, which was hilarious because all of us are sitting there wondering what's gonna come next. And it was tied together with music. And it was the history of the world. He's telling the entire history of the world in the Great Pyramid. And all of us are just kind of like, wow. And it was hot and he had these programs printed that were like laminated somehow so we could use them as fans, thank goodness. But he crushed it. I've never seen a more beautiful, this thing should have been on Broadway. It was God in a dialogue with himself on the entire history of the world. The metaphor being that the one divides itself into the many, into all of us, and creates this experience for all of us to be able to perceive itself through all of our eyes of perception. And it was so beautifully done. And of course he had all the right music. And there was a moment in his, you know, God soliloquy where the background music was that da, 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 da. And everyone starts crying because it was so emotional. Why? The one. would create all of this for learning and wisdom. To learn empathy, to learn love. It was one of the most powerful experiences and I had to sit back. I leaned back against the wall and I just said to myself, surrender. Surrender to what's coming. So, he finished his incredible masterpiece. And of course we couldn't record it. None of this could be recorded because no one's allowed to do these things in the pyramid. So we get special permission <laughs> as long as it can't be shown that other people have been able to do stuff like that. And so um, could not record it. But we do have an audio recording and it's amazing. <laughs> so I got to figure out what video to put it to uh, but you could listen to it and maybe I'll convince Alan to make a whole video for it uh, with the actual recording in the background. It was about 45 minutes and it was amazing. After he finished and we were all emotional, understanding this whole history of the world, as we sat in this great zodiacal clock of the great procession of the equinox, we all got up and we started doing ohm chanting and we had a lot of professional, well-known singers on this trip with us. And I have never heard an angelic choir
like I experienced that night. It was the most beautiful thing I think I've ever heard in my whole life. And I've been in there so many times. And of course, I've been in there with singing and everything. I've been in there with toning and om chanting and prayer and all these sacred moments. I've been in all of those moments. But there was literally a moment when I could hear Blue singing her lungs out and Vailana and others that were, that were there that were just amazing vocalists. Um, I think we all felt like somehow we had gone into another dimension experience. Uh, it was like being in heaven. And I'm not exaggerating. I think for anyone that was there, they would say that. It felt like we were in heaven, surrounded by love, surrounded by our close, close friends, alignment, uh, synchronization, miracle. It was astounding. So um, we had this experience. Everyone got to lay in the sarcophagus. Everyone was able to experience the resonance of the sarcophagus and what it feels like. And you find that right note and you go, mm, and then the whole thing goes, wah, 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 like super loud. It was just tremendously beautiful. It was one of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had in my life, if not the most. And I've had incredible experiences inside there. So from there, we went into uh, Caffrey Pyramid. And as we were walking into Caffrey, we saw Orion above us in the sky. Orion is a symbol, and a lot of people ask me about Orion. What's the significance of Orion, especially if you've read Raw Contact? You know, it talks about in the Raw Contact, it says many times there's no good and there's no evil. There's no duality. And yet it keeps referencing the kind of evil uh, people that were sort of greedy and conquering uh, from the Orion uh, star system. And it's interesting because that also matches the story of Orion. The story of Orion is one of, you could find it in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the story of Hercules is also synonymous in many ways with Orion, where Hercules ends up killing his whole family by accident, and then he has to redeem himself by completing the labors the 10 that became 12 labors. And again, there's a metaphor in that as well for the base 10 and the base 12 system, right? Which is the separation between our imperial and metric systems. All of this being made by consciousness. Nothing happens by accident in this world. Everything is pattern, not perceived when we don't understand it. Doesn't mean it's not there. So basically what... Um, what we learned through this whole uh, experience, you know, going into not only the King's Chamber, but then going into Caffre Pyramid. As we went into Caffre and we look at Orion as we enter that, this really represents the redemption of Orion. Orion is an analog for humanity. It's humanity going through the stages that it's meant to go through, all of it being predestined. The past determines the future, but the future determines the past equally. You cannot separate the two. They're inextricably linked. It's called entanglement. So what that means then is that as Orion representing humanity starts off through the cycle, it, Orion was famous for wanting to conquer everything. He was famous for wanting to be a womanizer. He was famous for chasing the, the Pleiades the seven sisters, and he was killed many different ways. And so Orion and the exact same constellation of Orion is the constellation of Osiris. It's not different, it's exactly the same. And in one of the stories, Orion gets killed by his lover, Artemis. In another one of the stories, he gets killed by a scorpion that stings his foot. Now, it's interesting because a scorpion that stings his foot is exactly opposite in the sky. It's as far away as it could possibly be in the sky from Orion. But it is right at the foot of Ophiuchus, which is directly opposite from Orion in the sky. Ophiuchus being also known as Asclepius. 
the serpent bearer. This is represented also by Bacchus or Dionysus. When Orion gets stung by the scorpion, maybe this could actually be a reference to an ego death. The ego death being corrected by the serpent bearer when Orion finally becomes aware of his Kundalini life force and no longer wants to conquer. And that's a major shift for humanity when humanity finally realizes that the hurt of one man in Gaza or anywhere is the hurt of all of us. And that the benefit of man is the benefit of all. The healing comes from understanding the wisdom of the serpent. The resurrection, we tend to think of the serpents as being this evil thing, right? We associate it with Lucifer. We associate it with darkness. We associate it with something you don't want to be stung by. You know, it walks around. But Scorpio is the one zodiac sign that goes through this transformation. And, you know, you start off as a scorpion that then becomes the that then becomes the snake, and then the snake turns into the eagle, and the eagle turns into the phoenix. And the phoenix turns into the wise man, Ophiuchus, who gets crowned by Corona Borealis, which is really just the shadow consciousness for Orion, the conscious mind. And that when those two see each other, they merge, and then it becomes sovereign. This is, I believe, the true story of the metaphor, the analogy of Orion, and that mankind is going through its ascension right now, leaving behind duality and choosing love instead, choosing wisdom, choosing to understand that the hurt of one man hurts all, the hurt of one woman hurts all, that we can live in harmony. And it comes down to us letting go of our egos. It comes down to us realizing that whatever zodiac sign we are, our opposite zodiac sign is our shadow consciousness. And it needs to be integrated. It needs to be recognized. We don't realize we do this, but through every decision we make, where we decide something makes us feel shame or something makes us feel bad, I am not that thing. I am not that. I used to get triggered by Donald Trump all the time. I get so angry because I'd see him speak and he drove me nuts. And I'm like, you know what? His policy is not so bad. Why does he have to be such an asshole? Why does he have to be such an egomaniac? Until finally one day I realized, what about Donald Trump is triggering me? Because he's just a reflection of me. Everything I attract is everything I judged. So maybe there's an aspect of me that I don't like about Donald Trump is because I don't like it about me. That was a tough, that was a tough road to hoe. That was a tough reality to face, but it's one that I absolutely faced. And so what I ended up doing so that I wouldn't judge him so much anymore, because every time I judge him, it would get worse and worse and worse. I would just stop myself and say, I am that I am before I would say anything. And I'd say it out loud because then people would be like, what the heck are you saying? The thing that I was trying to do was break myself and break my ego. The heart never breaks, only the ego does. When you really understand the cycle of time and what we're experiencing and living through. So as soon as I would say, I am that I am, I was basically healing this aspect of myself that simply wanted to be recognized and understood. It doesn't mean that I condone the things that are bad, that someone does but it means that we can understand and accept that it exists. You know, I'll give you an example. I posted a video yesterday of scenes of everybody coming out at the end of the trip in Egypt, and they were so happy. Everybody's like super happy and just spreading love. And yet there were so many people, I couldn't believe how many people there were that felt the need to comment and say, Oh, how horrible is this? People are just happy. This must be some sort of satanic act or something. People judge what they don't like about themselves. We don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. So 
The aspects that we don't like about ourselves become literally, we thought that was things we chose. Maybe it's all wrapped up into our numerology and astrology and gene keys. Maybe that's just all part of this game to learn greater wisdom about ourselves. It's a powerful thing when you look at your opposite sign and read all the opposite sign aspects to understand it because then you start finding that it's you. <laughs> it's such a powerful aspect. So in addition, you can do the same thing with Myers-Briggs types. Look at the opposite Myers-Briggs type and read the exact portrait of your opposite Myers-Briggs type. And you'll find the top three things that trigger you are things that you are, that you just don't want to see. True for me, true for all of us. Being able to integrate that shadow aspect of yourself and accept that it exists is tantamount to being able to enter into a new level of awareness and consciousness. Some referred to as Christ consciousness. Mary Christ consciousness. And that's what we're on the precipice of going into now. The world's going through a separation. Those that choose love and those that choose more judgment. Now, I don't believe we're here to learn more judgment. I've been down the path of judgment. I've been down the path and watched it fail. But the people that will choose judgment are the people that are meant to choose judgment. And we should thank them for choosing it. Because for every action, there must be an equal opposite reaction. And if certain people didn't end up staying and anchoring in the third dimension, we wouldn't be able to ascend to the fifth for those that do. That's just a fact. So I see it in gratitude. You know, I did a meme not long ago, about a week or so ago, where it showed a picture of this guy looking up and on one side, it was like all unicorns and rainbows. On the other side, it looked like this nuclear war. You could see like a, a nuclear cloud in the background. You know, something dystopian like that crazy show I watched <laughs> the other night on Netflix. Um, you know, it's like leave the world behind. And what was interesting about the meme was it said, when you start noticing the world is getting both better and worse all at the same time. That's because of the split that's happening. Yes. For there to be greater light in the world, there has to be also a backdrop of greater darkness. The one cannot exist without the other. Everything has to remain in balance. This is a law of physics. This is not only Newton who says this. It was Einstein who says everybody understands that for every action, there must be an equal opposite reaction. So in every movie, whether you're looking at you know, a film like Lord of the Rings, as soon as Gandalf goes from Gandalf the Great to Gandalf the White and gets more magical powers, that's when the orc army is starting to peak. We're in a play. It's a simulation of our own creation, of our own mind. Until you start recognizing the patterns, you'll basically live the same experience over and over and over again and call it fate. Until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our lives and we'll call it fate. That's a Carl Jung quote. And it's really true. So that night we went into, with this backdrop of information on Orion, just representing the ascension of Orion, the end of the cycle, no longer requiring to go through the cycles of reincarnation. and entering into a new existence, coming out of the duat, the world of duality. In Egypt, they don't say the word death, they say westing. The word for death is to go to the west. And Osiris is the great god of the west, the great bull of the west is his name. And why? Because it's with the Dacon, the Dacon part of astrology, which is part of Taurus. So we went into a uh, cafe pyramid and again, the angelic voices continued. And there was a, a wonderful person who had, who's a performance artist who had a blocked throat chakra. And 
it was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever seen to watch her so beautifully and naturally express her voice. Um, it had everyone in tears. I, I, it was incredible. Now the backdrop of Caffrey Pyramid is on all the walls are the animals of Noah's Ark. And the shape of the room itself is mirroring that of Noah's Ark. And it's the one with the sarcophagus that's in the ground floor, like a bathtub. The name of the Nile River anciently was Gion, the river that flows out of, that gushes out of the Garden of Eden. And we should have known because the name Gion means gushing water. We should have known the Garden of Eden was not in Mesopotamia because the Gihon was the original name of the Nile. If you look at the north part of the Nile, which is called Lower Egypt, it was always referred to as the Gihon River. And Gihon means Cush or gushing water. Another way to say Cush, the people of Cush, the Cushite kingdom. The, the river wasn't named Nile or Nilo until it was deep, down south, beyond Sudan. So I believe the true reference that we have in the Bible was probably the ancient Lamb of Chem. I don't believe it was Mesopotamia. They never found Babylon. There's no evidence that it was a ziggurat that they'd found. And I believe that and if actually you go into the old city of Cairo today, it's called Babylon. The old city is referred to as Babylon. It's right next to Ma'adi, which means calendar. So there's a fortress there as well. There was a fortress that was uh, there that was run by Sultan Kite Bey, who hired Leonardo da Vinci and many other polymaths and scholars from the Renaissance period, period uh, Europe to rebuild a lot of Egypt. And most of the buildings from that time period that still stand today were all built by Kite Bey, the Mamluk Sultan, who was also a philosopher king. Now, this leads into the other aspects of the story because one of the reasons why we were going to the Great Pyramid was because we were there to ignite and fully activate the last layer of the throat chakra. There are three layers, self-awareness, self-actualization, and self-transcend. So you could go in the shape of the throat chakra is a diamond pentagon, literally a diamond shaped pentagon. So if you look at an endoscopic view of what the throat looks like, at the center of it would be the vocal cords that also looks like a vagina, to be honest. What's around it is exactly the shape of a diamond shaped pentagon. It also matches the tunnel that goes from the other side of the chevrons that then leads to another grand gallery that we know they've already found. And the next grand gallery leads to another chamber exactly that da Vinci predicted in the last, uh, in the uh, Vitruvian man illustration of the throat chakra chamber. Because each of the Vitruvian man lines of the vertical and horizontal lines that he drew all represent different chambers inside the Great Pyramid. And this is the subject of my television show Codex, which the next season we're filming in January, and I'm super excited because all of this stuff is going to be in there, um, and so much more too. And Jason Liggett came on the trip with us to Egypt. Uh, he also happened to be the producer for both Alan's show and Matthias's show, and strangely, all three of our shows are like converging. <laughs> that the stories are just looking at it from different angles, but they're coming out to the same conclusions. So effectively, um, I'm super excited about this coming out. But we, I had already found that the pyramids have musical representations to them. So if you start off the Great Pyramid being two over one, so it's two over one pi, and you count that as two over one, and then you've got a circle that, uh, that would have a, uh, a semi-circle half over one half of its base, that would be one over one. So you start with a unison note. Then the square root of two, which can be formed out of that as well, square root of two over one gives us the middle of the scale, which is the diminished fifth. So you start off with unison, 
And then you've got two over one because you've got a circumference of that same circle of two pi versus its base of one pi. And so you've got two over one, it reduces down to you. So effectively, the Great Pyramid's representing one over one for unison, square root of two over one for the diminished fifth, augmented fourth, and the next octave. So you've basically got a starting note, you've got the middle of the scale that forms duality, it's literally the square root of two, because the square root of two is the essence of duality, and then the octave. And then you've got Khafre Pyramid, which is the perfect fifth. And Minkari Pyramid is the major third. And how do I get to that? Well, you take four over three is the height over the base proportions. The height happens to be 144 meters and its base is 216 and one half of its base is 108 meters. So 144 over 108. That gives you 1.33333 which is four over three, which is a perfect fourth. And its inverse would simply be to take the full base, which would be six over four, which reduces to three over two. That's the perfect fifth. And Menkari pyramid has a height versus its one half base of five over four. So that means you start off with the great pyramid at a note and let's say it's 216 Hertz and it's just da. Then Menkari pyramid becomes the third. Da. And then Caffrey Pyramid becomes the fifth. Da. So you got da, da, da. And then the octave doubles. You go to the octave for the Great Pyramid again, and you've got the da, 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 da. Literally, that's the music of the three pyramids on Giza Plateau. And it's unequivocal. You can't argue it, it's purely mathematical. The living stone is living stone of music. It's a 3D representation of this music. So we knew exactly the notes of precise temperament tuning and we sang those notes. The missing notes of the scale were in Abu Rawash, eight kilometers north. And we went there at the end of the week to dedicate and activate those pyramids, which we did do, with the exact notes that they are. Those notes representing the pineal and pituitary glands, the crown chakra. It was an initial activation. There will be many others. There have been literally thousands of people, and I wanna thank everyone that's gone to the Great Pyramid and to Giza Plateau to activate and do their part in activation of the pyramids. They all have. All of that was necessary work for us to be able to come and do it for Menkari. Menkari is the self-transcendence layer. So you've got self-awareness in the Great Pyramid. Then you've got self-actualization with the Khafre Pyramid. You've got self-transcendence with Menkari. That's the exiting of duality. It's choosing love over duality. And the major third, the da da, the major third is the frequency of love. That is love. When you watch a movie and they want you to feel romantic love, they play the major third in the background to change the tone if they want it to go to a heartbreak scene, then it's gonna to go to the inverse of the major third, which is the minor sixth. That's also in the structure. So in the experience of love is also the seed of heartbreak. And it's all in the same structure. The duality is built into it. The duality itself is just an illusion. It's your aspect or angle of perception that defines your experience with it. It's not what actually happened to you. What happens to you is what you perceive happened to you. It's not what actually happened to you, it's what you believe happens to you. And that's true for all of us. So then it takes us to the Trinity. It's this beautiful, holy Trinity. Then the next note would be the minor third and the minor third in the scale. So you've got diminished fifth at the center, which is the great pyramid. You've got the octave and the unison on the, the, the beginning of the scale and at the top of the scale for the doubled octave. Then you've got the, the diminished fifth then becomes the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth of calf ray because those are just the inverses of each other. Then Menkari, exactly the right order, is the major third and the minor sixth. The stone itself, its proportion of its cross section is defining the musical notes that it basically creates. 
One direction of it is the height over one half its base. The other inverse relationship is simply the full base over its height, done. So then you start looking for the minor third. Where's the minor third? Well, that's an Abu Rawash. And the minor third gives you a 67 degree angle. The major third gives you a 51.34 degree angle. That is exactly the proportion, exactly the angle of Benkari Pyramid. The perfect fifth and perfect fourth gives you exactly an angle in a right triangle of 53.13 degrees. And the diminished fifth gives us exactly of the Great Pyramid, the angle of 51.85397 degrees, which allows us to square the circle. You get the perfect circle with the Caffrey Pyramid, squaring of the circle with the Great Pyramid and squaring of the circle and the triangle because all three are equivalent. The area is now equal to the circumference and to the perimeter of the squares. If you take a square of one half of its base, and then Minkari Pyramid has the divine masculine, which is the perfect square, the square that has the same area as its perimeter, because it's four. Four is its side length. You take one half the base of each of the pyramids. So what we found was that the missing notes were in Abu Rawash, eight kilometers north. And actually, if you take the Orion constellation, and if you place it at an angle on top of the, 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 the three belt stars, then Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse as it's sometimes pronounced, becomes Abu Rawash. And it flips like an hourglass. And when it flips as an hourglass, maybe with the pole shift, then Regal takes that position. Regal is the other very bright star of Orion. So you could think of Orion constellation as operating like an hourglass with pole shifts. So with this, you know, we had an amazing experience. Um, Adam Roa gave an incredible poem that was all about transcending duality. And we finished the night in Menkari Pyramid, entering into this third layer of self-transcendence, the three layers of the throat chakra, the diamond-shaped pentagon. So the next day we had as an integration day and everyone was, because we were out until like three o'clock in the morning, everyone was pretty tired. Uh, so they slept for the day and then we came together as a group. And again, just coming together with this group felt so divine and angelic. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Uh, the session was led by Blue and by Andre and we had breakout sessions for everyone to sort of integrate what they'd experienced. And we were just in the Mina House Hotel. Then everyone had dinner on their own, uh, but everyone found each other and we ended up going to either the Indian restaurants or the Italian restaurant on the location. And the next day, we went to the uh, Black Pyramid in the morning, which is somewhere I'd never been before. It has a very in-depth labyrinth or maze underneath the structure. Um, and we went in there and then we walked around. We could see off in the distance, the Red Pyramid. We could see the Bent Pyramid. It was an amazing day. And then we went to Abu Sir, which turned out to be one of the highlights of the trip. Uh, Abu Sir at sunset, which is a pyramid complex with 14 pyramids that very few people go to. Uh, and the 14 pyramids all represent the 14 cuts of Osiris. Now you may have seen my posts on this, that the two zodiacal signs that are part of the Dacon are now coming out, which are Ophiuchus, the 13th, and Orion, the 14th, the missing 114th, Zodiac. And that these symbolize the resurrection and the change, the redemption of Orion, which is really just humanity, the resurrection of Osiris. So we've already been seeing a lot of Ophiuchus showing up in the public awareness. We're now gonna start seeing the same with Orion. And it's kind of obvious, Orion is right on the plane of the ecliptic. It's about, it's just barely under the plane of the ecliptic and Ophiuchus is just above the plane of the ecliptic. When you understand that in the zodiac, each of the signs of the zodiac must have a pairing that's its unique opposite pair, then you cannot have 13 zodiac, you must have 14. So Orion is a new zodiacal sign. And it's a symbology of the missing 114th of Orion, the missing 114th of Osiris, 
It was cut into 14 parts by his brother and one fourteenth was missing. Well, I think that's a symbology of, of that metaphor. So um, that night we had dinner at the Indian restaurant on uh, at the Mina house. And then the, uh, the last day we went to Abu Rawash, which is a newly discovered complex of people not sure if they were pyramids. Some people refer to it as a great pit. Uh, there were two pyramids there with casing stones that were granite. The base of Minkari Pyramid had a base of granite, but these two pyramids are believed to have been entirely granite, entirely rose granite. It's very difficult to build pyramids with rose granite and very difficult to build pyramids at the angle that these pyramids were built at. One of them is measured at 67.4 degrees, which is the 512-13 triangle, the triangle of precession, the triangle of time. It also is matching the 10-24-26 triangle. It's also the exact triangle of Vitruvian man in the square and the circle. So if you take the base of the square and use that as the base of a triangle and then connect it to the center of the circle atop it, then you have exactly that same proportion of 10, 24, 26, or 5, 12, 13. The Enochian tables is a table of 24 letters by 26 letters, right? And it goes all the way down with 624 being the total number of letters in it. And the whole thing is representing the encampment of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we decrypted that as well. Uh, and you could find that, uh, we did post that on, uh, on YouTube. So basically this had been the exact Abu Rawash pineal gland representation, this pyramid on the backside of the dollar bill, exactly that proportion. I first started to come across it uh, I'd say last March, because I knew with the perfect square and the perfect circle of Menkari and Kafri respectively and the squared circle of the Great Pyramid, that there must be a perfect triangle. Where would be the perfect triangle? And there are two perfect triangles. One triangle would be the equilateral triangle. The other would be the 512-13. But the equilateral triangle is not known for having its equality between its area and its perimeter. But clearly, Equilateral becomes important because each of the sides are equal. The equilateral triangle is the same shape as the pituitary gland, which is where the optic chiasm crosses, where your left eye connects to your right brain and your right eye connects to your left brain. Each eye being the seat of being able to see and perceive. One being the eye of rational thought and the other being the eye of irrational uh, the eye of intuition, the eye of being able to read your own feelings, the eye of Horus. So the eye of Ra, which is the conscious mind, the eye of Horus is the eye of the subconscious mind, the moon. One is represented by the sun, Ra, and the other represented by the moon, Horus. Now Horus is also the word we use to represent time because time is horology. The study of time is horology. So time, when we open our eye of Horus, our eye of intuition, we start to realize the true nature of time in higher dimension. And that that true nature of time in higher dimension is the notion that time flows backwards as much as it flows forwards. That the two are connected and that we have been artificially separating them just as we're now seeing with processional time and processional time. Within each year, we represent, you know, each, each year of the cycle of procession, right, um, is then accumulating up to the average lifespan of 72 years of man. I always wondered why da Vinci used 7.2 inches for the width of the square on the Vitruvian man. This is the fathom. 7.2, 72 inches is the fathom, the father, mother. We re reference the word fathom when we want to say how we could put our arms around something to understand something better. We say, oh, I want to fathom this, or I can't fathom something. Some people pronounce it wrong. I used to work with this guy who used to say, I can't phantom it. And I was like, that reminded me of Scooby-Doo, but that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> so, because it was unfathomable to him. But 
The fathom is the father and mother. Mother is just backwards. It's like all these symbologies are hidden within our year. We have 365 days. But that's because the solar calendar is 365.25 days. But if we look at the lunar calendar, it's 354 days. 354.4 days. If we add those two and find the mean value of both of them, it's 360 days exactly. So we just have been using only the solar calendar. We should be looking at it as a mean, a golden mean, right? A mean between the masculine and feminine aspects. That once we understand this, then our whole reckoning of how we see and perceive time changes. So basically what, what we find when we go to Abu Rawash is two pyramids that are covered in granite that exploded hundreds of meters out from their bases. What could have caused that explosion? Now, first of all, Abu Rawash sits on a plateau that is 300 feet higher than the Giza Plateau. 300 feet. So imagine you're standing on the Giza Plateau. You look off in the distance, eight kilometers, exactly 8,000 meters, which is not very far. It's about five miles. You could see it pretty easily. You look off in the distance and you see two pyramids up there. And one of the pyramids is standing at its peak compared to the Great Pyramid, a full 120 feet higher than the Great Pyramid. Can you believe that? Now, the Great Pyramid was the tallest building supposedly on earth for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, it was only in the 16th or 17th century, it was the 17th century that they actually built a tower that could go higher than 481 feet. So even today, building such a structure is not an easy task. It would be very difficult. For Christmas, my kids got me a uh, Lego set of the Great Pyramid, which was pretty cool. So we spent the day building it. And um, I have to say, it was, it was not that hard, but it was just tedious. It takes time, but it was fun to do it. And you can even see the structure inside the pyramid and the king's chamber and everything, and even the air shafts, it's all in there. It's pretty cool. So if you ever want to get like a fun gift for someone who likes Egyptology, that one's a pretty good one. So basically you look at the Giza, from the Giza Plateau at Abu Rawash and you realize there's something even more holy, even more important about the Abu Rawash Plateau. It's the crown chakra. Now, the throat is the bridge between the heart and the brain. I like to say this quote often. When the heart thinks and when the mind feels, the river of wisdom flows. When the heart thinks, which you don't associate normally with hearts thinking, and the mind feels, then the river of wisdom flows because that's when we get our absolute wisdom. Wisdom comes from an equal balance of the intuitive and the rational minds. A balance of the masculine and feminine, pure and absolute hemisynchronization of the two lobes of our brain. But what connects, what is the bridge between the heart and the brain? It's two things. In one axis, it would be the corpus callosum. In another axis, it would be our throats, the throat chakra. So that's why the throat chakra plays such a role and it comes from the word throne, throat and throne. You issue commands, you issue your existence, your sovereignty comes from the throne, from being able to access into your manifestation, your ability to have magic. When you get to self-aware, self-aware is great, then you start to understand, wait a minute, maybe the stuff, the more I learn, the less I actually know about myself. And then you get to this next level, you think you start to get enlightened because you can start to manifest things. You start to figure out how to manifest and actualize. Well, the manifestation and actualization is also still dependent on time. And it isn't until you get to the third pyramid, Menkari, which one half of its base is a square that when placed at the center of the base of the pyramid, and then you place a circle from the top to the base, the square will exactly perfectly touch the circle. The, the corners of the square touch the circle that share the same base with it. So that is defining for us another level of balance between masculine square and feminine circle. And that means you can leave duality. 
you can go and transcend it. It doesn't mean that you no longer feel for the people that are still experiencing it. In fact, the whole reason you get to that layer is because you've learned how to love and empathize. You don't get to that layer unless you've already learned the love and empathy and that you start feeling literally the pain of the world. This is the journey. This is the hero's journey. The hero's journey is not about conquering something outside. It's about learning and remembering who you are. It's about finding who you are. It's finding your own divinity. It's, it's realizing what you wanted to learn and why you wanted to learn it. And it's such a beautiful journey and path. So we went to Abu Rawash. We knew the notes that we had to basically play in the exact frequencies of the notes. And thanks to Tony Mazzotti, uh, TonyMazzotti.com, who took my work on the 24-hour uh, wave of time. So 24 note scale that is a 432 scale and a 528 scale that actually fit inside each other as two snakes in a 24 note scale. They're perfectly fitting inside. It. And the reason I discovered it is because I looked at the Giza Plateau and looking at the proportions, I thought, well, there must be something else here as well. Not just of these three pyramids, but what about the plateau itself? So I took the, and Alan Green and I worked on this together and I took the upper right corner of the Great Pyramid, which would be the northeast corner, and made a rectangle of the entire Giza Plateau to the lower left corner of Menkari Pyramid, the third pyramid, which is the southwest corner. And you make a rectangle of that, and guess what the proportions are? Exactly 432 at its base and 528 at its height. So 432 is the Ida, and the 528 is the Pingala. The Shashumna is making, guess what? A 444 hertz scale inside of it as well. All in precise temperament tuning. I have not published this yet. I've not posted on this yet, but I will. It's just, I've got so much stuff to do and I'm still synthesizing everything that happened on this trip. So Tony Mazzotti, Tony Mazzotti, M-A-Z-Z-O-T-T-I.com. So check out his page um, on precise temperament tuning. He took all of my work in tuning and, and put it there. And then there's also on YouTube, you can find under precise temperament tuning, a lot of stuff there uh, about this musical clock. And the musical clock was something that I discovered not long ago. I think it was about in April. And that each day of the week could be a note. And each hour within that day is another note. And each minute and each second is another note. And so you can listen to and in fact watch it in its coloration, the passage of time. So they turned that into a meditation. It's very cool. Check it out. Well, I took that and I used that because it was using the exact precise temper tuning notes. And I played it at, um, I had a little Bose speaker and I played it at Abu Rawash. We all went down into this large pit where the stones had blown out of. And I actually believe that this was at one time the Tower of Babel. It would have been by far the tallest building in the world. It's an equilateral triangle pyramid with a 60 degree angle of ascent. And the other pyramid has 67.4 degrees, the same as the one on the dollar bill. One representing the, the one on the dollar bill is the Eye of Providence, which is coming from the pineal gland. And these are the two pyramids shapes of the Philosopher's Stone. Philosopher's Stone being represented in alchemy as an equilateral triangle, a square, and a circle within that. Uh, I've drawn it in three, in perspective drawing, I'll show you guys right here. There you go. So an equilateral triangle with a four point base, a square within that, and a circle or sphere, or sorry, cube and a, and a sphere within that. So that's the Philosopher's Stone. It represents the achievement of that balance. It also represents the pituitary gland. Together with the pineal gland, there's only one satellite pyramid of that pyramid. And the satellite pyramid stood at 103.7 feet high because of its 67.4 degree angle. Its base width is 86.4 feet. 
for 86,400 seconds in a day. All of the pyramids on Giza and the pyramids here were built with knowledge of the foot, cubit, and the meter. Which makes you question, in what time era were they built? Were they built in the future that we just call our past? The other side of the cycle. And then the pineal gland pyramid, the one on the dollar bill, um, also exploded out. But we still can see and can measure. Even Larry uh, Paul went to Egypt and was able to measure it uh, with a level and found that, yes, I was right, 67.4 degrees for that pyramid and 60 degrees for the other. That's well known, in fact, the, that the other pyramid was 60 degrees. Imagine a 60 degree and a 67 degree angled pyramid with the same base, the larger of the two, the same exact size base as Menkari Pyramid. We're talking a pretty large pyramid here and going straight up at 60 degree angle. That's incredible. And then exploding out and seeing the rose granite pieces of it spewed out hundreds of meters. That's insane. Essentially what you're talking about is two pyramids that were fully made of crystal that I believe represented the crown chakra. I believe that when they were built, they were built by Nimrod who wanted to achieve godhood, God realization. So he built two pyramids, one for the pineal, one for the pituitary. This was at a time when humanity was supposed to have had telepathy, one language. That the Tower of Babel exploded, it was destroyed somehow, and that when it was destroyed, so was our ability within the pineal and pituitary gland to have telepathy. Now I think we're gonna start seeing that that's gonna be returning very soon. We don't only have five senses, even those that admit to understanding that we have a sixth sense with ESP, realize that that gets broken down into clear audience, clear touch, clear sentience. There's so many different ways to categorize ESP. But, but basically where we're going now is a six squared. So your senses are actually 36 senses. And the subtleties of each of those senses, smelling things that aren't necessarily there physically as like memories, right? And I'm sure many of you have experienced this already. You're probably already starting to see that you can actually smell things that aren't necessarily there. And we've basically been numbed down. We've missed a lot of this because we just didn't know that it was part of our experience. Well, now it's going to be part of our experience again. It's part of a DNA activation that comes through the throat chakra. The throat chakra is the place that the DNA activation actually begins from because it's like a firewire download and all structure comes through the throat. The throat is the place of the structure. So perhaps Nimrod was building the two philosopher's stone pyramids, the two shapes that are depicting philosopher's stone, geometry, the equilateral triangle, and the 512.13 triangle, doubled. One representing time, the eye of Horus, being able to see time differently, the eye of providence, realizing the procession and the precession of time. We dedicated both of the pyramids. Uh, one was inside the pit. Uh, we had an incredible prayer that was led by uh, Zach Bush. Uh, we had, uh, Shervine spoke to us also about the importance of health and how a tree can only grow high into the heavens with its branches if its root system is plunging deep, deep into the earth. That in order to become ascended, you must be equally grounded. That that is actually what God realization is, is when you have found that perfect balance of being in master, in mastery of two worlds. And that's what it says in the hero's journey too. The hero's journey you start off, you have a reluctance to the call, you end up in the special world of magic. And then you end up on the other side, finding the elixir, getting a gift from the goddess, and then getting what's called the stage of mastery of two worlds. Both the spiritual and the material worlds have to be able to be manifested in by the individual who is able to become an aeon. And Aeon is going to be the next of my, the, the name of my next book. 
Um, I'm writing a book right now <clears throat> called Philosopher. And then after that book is done, the last in the series will be the fourth in the series will be Aeon. So Philomath, Polymath, Philosopher, then Aeon. And Aeon is really about a divine avatar. It's when you realize and remember who you are, that everyone here is God. No one on earth is better or any different or any better than anyone else. They just chose different paths. They chose different learnings. It's like some people want to stay in the game longer. More power to them. Nothing wrong with that. Some people want to experience everything that's yet to be experienced because they're there to learn. And it's a great honor to be able to give this to the Akashic Record. Our vision, our perspective with our unique conditioning biases is informing the Akashic Record in such a beautiful way. And it makes the Universal One more wise. You know, each one of us, one of the things I realized and learned before I left and discovered that if I drew a line, I wanted to know what the reciprocal value of that line would be without having to measure it. So draw an arbitrary line, and then you can use one reference point on what a scale of unit measure would be. But with that one scale of unit of measure, then you could say, okay, I'm gonna draw a reciprocal length of a line without measurement. And then I realized it's already hidden within every single polygon and every single polyhedron that exists. All you do if you take a heptagon, seven-sided object, right, that's a polygon, it's a regular polygon. You draw a line from the top to one of its other vertices. Because it's this odd number, it's not going to be straight down to the center. It's going to be offset. I want to find the reciprocal value of that line. It's simple. All I have to do is connect the other two vertex, vertices up at the top, right? The other two points on the heptagon. And when I connect those two points across horizontally, the line that cuts across down here, that goes down from the top of the heptagon down to the base of the heptagon. The portion that is intersected at the top, that one small part, is exactly the reciprocal value of this linked line. It's right there. When you have every side being a value of one. And that doesn't only work with a heptagon, it works with every single polygon. So within every polygon, you've got the answer to radiation and gravity. Because gravity is the center where there's no lines when you connect all the different points. That's the gravitational aspect, the implosive force. The radiative force is the polygram. You connect each of those vertex points all around the polygon and it creates a star. That star is radiative effect. The relationship between that and the center circle that has nothing within it, that circle inscribed, is radiation versus gravity. Ha! Mind blower, it's in every single polygon, hidden in plain sight. It's beyond genius. I'm gonna publish a paper on this as well. And it's just right there. And nobody ever looked to see what the relationship was, that it was exactly reciprocal relationship. And it must be so, because the reciprocal relationship is the definition of the inverse square law. You could take any number, 432 and square it and then take its inverse, a square of its inverse. And then you multiply it by 432 again and you get the exact reciprocal value of 432, which is 0.0023148. The inverse square law is just X and one over X. And the inverse square law of X and one over X is defining a black hole and a white hole. The mirror of consciousness that every polygon defines. Now, there's something more significant about this, though, because what it tells us is that every side of a polygon is unique. If you use a fixed format to look at it, every side, you might think, oh, there's a side of 24 sides on a, uh, you know, a uh, Icosi tetragon, a 24-sided polygon shape. That's the prime number pattern is off of that. And it's basically a flattened two-dimensional form of the cuboctahedron. But if you look at that and you realize that I've got a fixed sort of radius going around this, 
and it has a, a specific degree position that no other side will have. So each side is individualized. And yet, because of this relationship of reciprocity, one side of a polygon recreates, has enough information to recreate the entire polygon. So let's say that you are one side of a polygon with 8.3 billion sides. You're one out of 8.3 billion people. Yet the information embedded within you is enough to recreate the entire other 8.2999999 billion sides. In our uniqueness is our unity. The great message of all of this is that most people, when they go through a spiritual path, start to hate themselves and they hate their persona that they created. They loathe it. I did it. And then they start judging other people for still having egos because they're still stuck on their egos. It takes someone with a big ego to notice another ego. People that are truly humble only perceive humility in other people. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because the people that claim to be woke that's kind of the joke of it all. The people that claim to be woke and are still judgmental, they're only through a small portion of their awakening cycle. The telltale is when they transcend judgment and they realize that everyone here is equal. There's not a single person that's better or worse than anyone else. I'm not afraid of the people that have darkness within them. I'm afraid of the people that believe they have no darkness in them. Every villain that ever lived believed they were a hero. Every villain that ever lived believed they were the hero. It goes right back to the Batman series. Hope that you live long enough to defeat the villain, but not so long you actually become the villain. We see that a lot in the world. We don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. When we start seeing the world as everyone being humble, that's when we've achieved humility. We don't need to abhor our personas. They exist for a reason. That's what individuation means. We're not dissolving completely and your, your entire individuality is gone. No. Individuation in the truest sense of it means that you've embraced not only the shadow, but you've actually come back to your persona and embrace that fully too, because you realize there are no mistakes. What we thought of as destiny was just the free will of our higher self, the path that we chose, the path that we needed to live, the path we needed to experience. So we activated, we started the activation process for Abu Rawash. And I think that that means that the global pineal gland and pituitary gland is gonna be coming back online. But the throat chakra is now fully opened. The implications of this, I think, are beyond what I can comprehend right now. It'll be very significant in 24. 2024 is going to be a year of dramatic change, more than I think any of us have ever experienced before. It's gonna make 2020 look like nothing. But all of this is actually leading and guiding us to the understanding that time cycles on itself. I stayed in Bora Bora for Billy Carson's wedding and I was stunned to find that the island shape itself was an Ouroboros. Even sounds like it's the Ouroboros. Bora Bora. And within the center of this snake that has more of a square shape, because the snake representing normally the feminine, but then the square shape giving it the masculine, is a dragon. The dragon. We're going into the year of the dragon in 2024. So with that shift, you're going to see the major split. Some will choose love. Some will choose more judgment. You know, in relationships... 
probably the most important piece of wisdom I ever accumulated out of a relationship was that at some point being right had to get subordinated to the importance of the relationship. Because I could fight all day to be right. But if your relationship is one that is truly loving, then it must be that being right and the judgment must be superseded by the love itself. Why would the universal one divide itself into all these different aspects, all these different perspectives? I believe the universal one separates itself into the many simply for the joy of becoming one again by remembering who it is. And the process along the way is like a breathing cycle. That this is how universal consciousness expands. This is why the universe is expanding. The Akashic record is expanding with the universe and we are expanding it through our own unique viewpoints and perspectives. The only thing real in this illusion is how we feel. That makes it real. The only thing real in this illusion is what we feel. And in order to feel it, we have to believe in some way, shape or form, what we are experiencing is real. So we're in a very sophisticated mind consciousness game. And the game is actually not to learn to escape. The game is to learn how to fall in love with it just as it is. The game is to learn how to feel, to feel empathy for the suffering. The purpose of it is to realize the beauty that underlies all of it. That enlightenment is when your expression of love supersedes the desire for one objective truth. The realization that your perspective on truth is only one facet of a larger prism with maybe billions upon billions upon billions of facet sides. That all the facts you thought you accumulated were actually just facets. And that the truth is the more you learn, the less you actually know. I wanted to share with you guys this today because all the things happening in the world should be leading us hopefully for those that have chosen this. And if you're on this call with me right now, very likely you are one of those people that is choosing love. It's not spiritual bypassing. It's getting out of the rat race. It's choosing acceptance and love both for yourself and for everyone else. To do your part to help. And while we were there, I was very happy that we had Spencer who was leading this effort on getting, um, and I'll put it, when I post this, I'll put the link here so you can all look at it, but he's leading this effort in Egypt to get clean water into Gaza over the Rafa border. And while we were there, he gave a presentation about this because of course, we hate watching the suffering. We hate the suffering exists. It's very painful to see what's happening. It's very painful to see how we can become so dehumanizing. I've been to Yad Vashem, Holocaust Museum, twice in Jerusalem. And I wept. And to think that it's okay for one child to die, um, to me just doesn't make any sense. We spend so much time as a world spending money and resource on ways to kill each other. How does this make sense? So Spencer was able to, with the efforts of our group that was in Egypt, to get six large semi truckfuls of water through the border. And it's small and I wish we could do more, but water is so necessary for life. 
but I was so glad that he was there and that brave people like him are doing this, literally risking their lives to do this, to save lives. The only thing that's real is what we feel. That's why it's necessary to populate the Akashic. The Akashic is a blockchain storage, decentralized storage where all of us is a node of validation through our perception. And this universal intelligence, I don't like the word artificial because all intelligence is intelligent. This universal intelligence is expanding because of our experience. And the backdrop of the play is the zodiac and the procession of equinox, the two aspects of time. Time processes and it precesses. And it's beautiful. And why is it all done? Because the universal one wants to learn more wisdom. The ultimate philomath. The universal one realizes that the only way to learn truth and experience it is through separating perceptions and blocking aspects of our vision creating subconscious and conscious mind separations. Until that stage of the play is over. And for many, it is now. And now those people that choose that enter into Christ consciousness. Today is not just a celebration that we use around the world for Christmas. In pagan times, it was the representation of the winter solstice. Not only was it the winter solstice, but it was also the birthday of Osiris, Orion. The symbology extends all through from pagan times to Christianity and Jesus being the absolute exemplar of choosing love over conditionality, choosing love over judgment that that is being the change you want to see in the world. So my Christmas Christ consciousness message for you today is to be the change you want to see in the world and choose love. Love you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your holiday weekend. And I uh, will be seeing you again soon, I'm sure, here on IG Live. Bye. Mm -hmm.